we'll do so from a recording at some uh, future point. This is the first lecture of 2017 in the uh, series that we call Current Issues in Bioethics. And there are second year medical students here in the room and others who are invited uh, from anywhere to participate in these by viewing online. We have the privilege of having here my colleague from the University of Kansas Medical Center, Dr. Carla Kearns. Dr. Kearns is an assistant professor of palliative medicine at, at uh, KU Hospital and uh, Health System. She is assistant professor in the Department of History and Philosophy of Medicine. She has a PhD in history, focusing on history of medicine from the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, is boarded in internal medicine and palliative care medicine. In addition to that, uh, this is a Renaissance woman. Uh, Dr. Kearns is also uh, uh, trained and very, very proficient as a clinical ethics consultant. And uh, I value her greatly in that role because I, uh, I work in clinical ethics consultation over at KU as well. In fact, I almost got here a little bit late, breathless, because I was busy in an office responding to email that coincidentally came this morning about Dr. Kearns, a colleague of ours on the Hospital Ethics Committee at the University of Kansas Hospital, emailed me this morning and said, I was wondering if we ever honored members for their special contributions. Carla Kearns is a standout. Her chart notes, doing ethics consultation, but palliative medicine as well, her chart notes give wonderful guidance without being prescriptive, and she has such passion for this. So we have emailed a little bit about this, and my email response immediately was, I don't know if we ever give awards for something like this, but I could be easily persuaded in this case because Dr. Kearns, I wrote, and I say, is a standout among standouts. Thank you for being here with us. Can you hear me in the back? OK. Um, so uh, as uh, usual for these sorts of events, I have a good 45 slides. I expect you to copy them um, closely. Just kidding. Um, I'm really interested in making sure that, um, that we have a dialogue as much as is possible in this kind of amphitheater. Um, I want to draw on the experience in the room. How many EMTs do we have here? Excellent. So we got a few here, a few. How many nurses? How many folks went to nursing school first? Not as many. Um, and how many people have ever taken a CPR class? I'm expecting that's everybody. OK. So I'm going to give you um, an overview of um, some of the history of CPR. Where did we get the practices we have now? Um, how are they changing and how can we improve them? Um, and then what do we do when we've reached the limits of what medicine can do? Um, I have uh, no uh, financial conflicts of interest. Um, so resuscitation technology really comes from looking at how to handle strangulation victims, drowning victims, choking victims. By the 1760s and 1770s, European cities were losing hundreds of residents a year, particularly to drowning. Um, one city in particular in Europe um, faced a terrible problem with this. Um, what city in Europe is the wettest? I don't know the answer, but could you slide over yeah. just a little bit for the camera? Yeah, yeah. There we go. So, um, so I might have thought Venice, but actually it turns out that um, Amsterdam, with all of those canals. There we go. We got the answer in the back here. 
um, was, um, was the city that lost most uh, to drowning. And so they created a rescue squad. They created protocols for rescue. Pulling people out of the water and trying to get the water out of their mouths, out of their lungs. Um, there were a variety of different um, techniques for, um, for trying to use the arms to do this. It was a little unclear what they were up to. Um, but, um, but using a fireplace bellows to blow air in and let it come out, that kind of makes sense, right? Um, in uh, London, they, um, they create the Humane Society, again, for, um, for recovering drowning victims. Um, the, uh, this timeline of CPR, um, I, as a historian, I would say is pretty good. Um, there is a theory about blowing tobacco smoke up your butt, but I'm going to spare you that one. Um, <laughs> It's not completely nuts, because what they're really trying to do is get you to absorb the nicotine to get your heart rate up. Anyway, um, but mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing um, starts uh, to be used by some folks as early as the 1740s, um, 1760s. Um, they start to set up, um, again, uh, squads to try to recover victims and, um, and help them survive. Um, and then we go through a long period when not much seems to change um, in relation to these technologies. Remember, this is not a time when heart disease is really the leading cause of death. Tuberculosis, accidents, um, diarrheal, di diarrheal diseases of childhood, those are what kill people. Um, in the 19th century. And so it's not until heart disease becomes the leading cause of death. About when do, does that happen? Yeah, so your grandparents or great-grandparents would really be the first generation. Um, angina is well described um, starting only in about the 1890s. Um, the first uh, American president who has a heart attack in office is Eisenhower in the 1950s. Um, and, uh, and so we start to see some, um, some changes in, um, in how we think about and how we work on these things. Um, George Cryle, uh, 1903, he's at, um, uh, it's either Case Western or Cleveland Clinic. I can't remember. He's in Cleveland, though. Um, he's actually probably the leading scholar of sepsis. Um, and shock um, in this period and does a lot to help us understand how to resuscitate people from shock. Um, and then in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s is when you really get modern CPR. Um, this is the Niagara Falls Power Company. What does this have to do with CPR and resuscitation? So there's drowning, plenty of drowning in the Niagara River, but that's actually not what I'm going for. So when we start to electrify American cities, we have this problem. High voltage electricity kills people, and it particularly kills linemen. And by the 1930s, the electrical companies had figured out that young, healthy linemen who got one big shock often died. But they'd also figured out that if they got a second shock, sometimes they came back. And so they went to the engineers and the doctors at Johns Hopkins and they said, can you make us the box to give the second shock? Um, and this is what they come up with. Um, in the 1930s, when they start working on this project, um, these are the first internal paddles. Um, so probably not so useful for the lineman to save his buddy, but our first attempt at defibrillation successfully. Um, first in, um, in rats, then in dogs. Um, they experiment for a long period of time. And it takes them over 20 years, but they finally produce the first external defibrillator um, for shocking the lineman or the cardiac patient um, out of ventricular fibrillation. Um, one of the students working on this project also notices that those paddles that are about 15 pounds, turns out when you put them on the, um, on the dog's chest, his blood pressure went up. And they said, huh, I wonder if we, if we could push on the heart and see if that helped. 
And so CPR as part of defibrillation comes out of that simple observation by the, um, the student assistant. Uh, I hope you guys are, uh, are working on something similar in your um, jobs. Just kidding. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of steps that, um, that come next in the development of modern CPR, um, showing that mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, even though you've already used that air, still provides adequate oxygenation, showing that, um, that you can save lives. And again, the US military has a big interest in this. Why? They have lots of drowning victims. They have lots of guys who go down in planes. They have lots of young, healthy people who ought to be able to recover. And so creating a protocol for their medics to be able to help folks who, um, who have had um, accidents that, um, that lead them to a cardiac arrest or to a respiratory arrest is, um, is important to them. Um, by 1960, um, CPR is developed first for um, physicians and healthcare providers. This is also when we start to get cardiac ICUs as separate parts of the hospital. Um, a, one of Kansas City's senior cardiologists was just telling me this weekend that the problem with the cardiac ICU was the cardiologist couldn't sit there 24 seven. And so it led to the real empowerment of the nurses in the cardiac ICU, because if you waited for the cardiologist to come from home, how long can you, um, can you leave the patient before you start doing CPR, before you start defibrillating, before you start giving medications? Designing protocols to allow nurses and EMTs and paramedics um, and uh, even um, non-specialist physicians um, to resuscitate people with cardiac disease um, was a big part of the creation of the cardiac ICU um, and a big part of improving mortality from cardiac disease. Um, heart disease becomes the leading cause of death in the United States in about the 1950s. Um, it's TB until the 1920s, and then cancer takes over. Um, but since there are many different kinds of cancer that get counted separately, heart disease takes over fairly quickly after World War II. Um, and uh, they start thinking about not just in hospitals and training nurses and other healthcare providers, but then out of hospitals. And I want you to remember this 1972. In Seattle, they trained 100,000 people in the early 1970s to do bystander CPR. Seattle will come back later. Um, the, it's kind of amazing that it took us this long to figure out the Heimlich maneuver. Um, but uh, Henry Heimlich actually just died last month. Um, he was a thoracic surgeon, um, and he comes up with, um, with, of course, the standard maneuver for choking victims uh, in the early 1970s. He spent a lot of time working on showing people how to use it. Anybody know who this other guy is? Yeah, Johnny Carson. So he goes on late night television to show everybody how to do it. So you, you get this development, finally, of a system. There's something we can do. And fairly quickly, you get protocols like this. This is a, um, a modern one, but, um, but starting in the early 1970s, because it's not the cardiologist who's going to be there when this happens, they need standardized protocols. Um, emergency medicine becomes its own specialty in the 1980s. But, um, but in the 1970s and 80s, again, emergency doctors are also folks who are working on these protocols. What do we do when the person comes in with chest pain? And how can we improve their survival? What medicine should we give? What can we study to try to figure out how to do this better? Um, when you look at ICU care, emergency care, um, care for sepsis, care for heart disease, you'll notice tons of these protocols because it turns out that they save lives. That yes, you have to individualize the care that you're giving for the patient in front of you, but I'm not going to be in a position to evaluate all the literature on whether I should give an aspirin or not and whether that improves survival by 25 or 30 or 35 percent based on what dose I give myself. Somebody needs to review that information and give everybody a sense of what that looks like. And so guidelines um, and clinical trials really take hold in cardiology in a very big way in the 1960s and 70s. 
Um, and these kinds of protocols are a big product of that. Um, you also need a system. So um, what do we call this? Yeah, so this is the chain of survival from the community into the hospital and then back out in terms of getting people the care they need. Um, this is, uh, again, current data. Um, about 11% of folks treated by EMS for an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest will survive. But if they get bystander witnessing um, and they have a shockable rhythm, their survival can triple. So this is an area where, um, where a lot of people die, and a lot of people don't have to die if they really get optimal care. How many of you are going to practice rural medicine? So more people in this room than in most medical schools in the country. And so thinking about what is it that your community needs, what is it that your patients need, what is it that you can do, and what is it that may not be possible just because um, people have their heart attacks alone at home. That's actually one of the bigger risk factors for dying is that you were home alone um, when it happened. And that's true no matter your race, no matter your class, no matter where you live, um, whether it's um, New York City or Atlanta or Hayes, Kansas, um, or, uh, or even someplace smaller, that having somebody be able to help you um, is, uh, is really critical. Um, we are uh, still looking at, um, at better ways of doing this. Um, this is uh, 2015. The Institute of Medicine sat down and said, all right, what else could we do to improve um, survival from cardiac arrest? It's still the th third leading cause of death. Although I'm a little suspicious of that number, only because um, everybody's heart eventually stops. Um, and whether that was the underlying cause of death or whether something else was the underlying cause of death, um, we could debate later. Um, survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest in the United States on average is still only about 6%. So it was 11% if EMS got to you, but it's only half of that. If, um, if you don't get uh, EMS before you pass away. Um, in, in hospitals, it's between 15 and 25%, depending on um, what hospital, what community, what resources, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, and four out of five cardiac arrests happen at home. So for folks who take a bystander CPR class, who are they most likely to end up doing CPR on? A family member. What's the most obvious thing here? Wow. Yeah, southerners die of heart disease, um, apparently at much higher rates. Colorado is either healthy or unpopulated, I'm not sure which. Minnesota, I guess the Mayo Clinic is doing a really good job, or um, all that snow shoveling is good for your heart. Um, so the southern belt, if you look at a lot of other data, if you looked at, say, maps of cardiac risk factors, Appalachia and the American South would definitely come up high in obesity, high in diabetes, high in cholesterol, high in smoking. Um, and so it kind of makes sense, this fits, that this is where you would have a lot of, um, of heart disease death. But in addition, about 25% of people who present with heart disease, their presenting symptom is sudden cardiac death. And if they don't get defibrillation and bystander CPR and EMS service within the first 10 minutes, they're going to die. So what do you think the chances of you're being able to get all those things in Mississippi. Yeah, not so great. They just, it's, you know, it's I, nothing mean about Mississippi. Turns out the one county in Mississippi uh, in the north that is a little bit orange instead of completely red, that's where the state nursing school is. Just interesting. Um, 
but um, but so um, so this is partly a matter of epidemiology, and it's partly a matter of distribution of healthcare resources. So when you look at survival rates by community, um, again the epidemiology, what is the incidence um, and prevalence of heart disease? Um, what is the likelihood that somebody who has known heart disease is going to get secondary prevention? Um, treatment of diabetes, treatment of hypertension, um, treatment of other cardiac risk factors to decrease ongoing damage, good treatment of diabetes. Um, what are the chances that they're going to get um, basic, uh, one, primary care, two, um, follow up with a cardiologist, three, at the time that they have their crisis, that they're going to get basic um, cardiac care, advanced cardiac care, um, an ambulance within five to ten minutes. The community I grew up in in upstate New York, ambulance transport time was 45 minutes. If you had a heart attack and your heart stopped, you were dead before the ambulance got there, if there was even anybody to call one. Um, and there are lots of communities in the country that are still um, uh, looking at that um, kind of um, survival. So, um, so community factors, time to discovery, likelihood of bystander CPR, time to defibrillation. What was the city in 1972 that started training the community in CPR? Seattle. So their survival rate is three times the national average and 30 times the survival rate in the city of Detroit. Now having uh, worked in Detroit, there's some special problems there. But, um, but most cities, you're looking at more like 6 or 7 percent. Not And most ur rural areas, you're looking at more like 2 to 3 percent, just because people aren't getting to care quickly enough. Um, so uh, we've done lots of things. From the primary prevention level, we've started training communities in CPR, and Seattle shows us that works. Um, we've started using all kinds of other strategies. You can get CPR apps that will walk you through the CPR on your phone, even if you didn't, never had um, CPR training. You can get uh, this app from the AHA that will give you a map of um, all the defibrillators that are registered near you so that you can send somebody to go get one. Um, you can get um, EMS to walk you through CPR over the phone. Um, so there are a lot of ways that we're trying to get the information to folks um, at the point where crisis is happening. Um, if my grandfather, who had a heart attack in his 50s and another in his early 60s and had his quadruple bypass before he was 65 and had four or five um, male members of his family die of heart disease in their 60s, if he were still alive, I'd probably buy him this and teach my grandma to use it um, because it's a thousand bucks and he would have been high risk for needing it and um, living out uh, outside of Wichita would be much less likely to get defibrillation within five to ten minutes without it. Um, so we, we are at a point where both systems and technology are bringing some of this care to the bedside very quickly. Um, I thought that was a nice way to remember it. And again, just in case. Um, so in the hospital, it's kind of a different matter. Out of hospital cardiac arrests, you can have them from young healthy people who have some congenital heart defects or some arrhythmias. It can be somebody who's having their very first heart attack, who's never had a problem before. But in the hospital, we get a lot more people in this green zone who are having asystole and pulsus electrical activity from other things. They're acidotic, they're hypotensive, they have a thrombosis from a PE, they have um, a, um, other electrolyte abnormalities. My hospitalized patients who have a cardiac arrest, usually, unless they're in the cardiac unit, unless they really have a primary cardiac issue, they're not going to do well. 
Um, and, uh, and the folks with cancer and sepsis and multi-organ failure are by and large in that lower green um, line. But the folks who are in the cardiac intensive care unit are by and large in that orange line. Um, if you can treat their, um, their blockages, if you can treat their pump failure, they don't have to die of an arrhythmia. And um, defibrillators are our classic way now um, of solving that both with the, um, with the kind that, um, that I just showed you. There's also life vest defibrillators that we put on folks who we're not going to do an implanted one for a variety of reasons. Um, or we implant defibrillators now in people. Um, so again, you just it's different inpatient versus outpatient. Most folks who are out of the hospital having a cardiac arrest, they're actually more likely to be able to be resuscitated if you can get to them in time. Um, the, uh, the best place in the country, it turns out, to have your cardiac arrest is O'Hare Airport. Um, not really sure why, although I think there are probably two factors. One is you had to be healthy enough to get on the plane. And two is a lot of doctors, nurses, and other health care providers go through O'Hare. A um, bunch of medical societies are based in Chicago, et cetera. Um, sorry, I said this. So this is also a real area where quality of care is important. Um, and where variations in quality of care can make a big difference in survival. Um, from one hospital to the next, the rate of um, survival can vary two or threefold. Um, some of that has to do with simple things like, do they have a cardiac catheterization lab? Is it staffed 24-7? Do they have a cardiologist on call 24-7? Or is that person going to come in the next day, um, later in the day? Do they have... Um, what is the capacity of their ICU and what is the experience of the people who are staffing it? Um, I couldn't find the graph for you, but a colleague of mine who studies hospital to hospital transfer of patients with heart attacks tells me that hospitals that treat less than 20 heart attacks a year have pretty good outcomes because they look at it and say, shit, and send the patient to a bigger hospital. Places that treat 21 to 99 heart attacks a year have the worst outcomes because they can handle a basic one, but they're less likely to recognize when they're in over their head. And places that treat more than 100 um, up through thousands, um, there's a marginal improvement um, as you get to bigger and bigger hospitals, but, um, but by and large, you need 100 heart attacks a year to keep your team really um, sharp. And this is just another set of, um, another analysis of uh, registry data looking at what factors are important in quality of heart attack care. Um, so frequency of cardiac arrest, just keeping people in practice. Um, monitoring for interruptions of chest compressions. When they look at particularly in-hospital CPR, um, we spend an awful lot of time looking for the rhythm and stopping compressions, and that's actually really bad for survival. Um, adequate resuscitation training at your own hospital. Um, time to defibrillation. Um, is it tracked and how are they doing with it? Um, immediate code debriefing so you can figure out what went well, what didn't go well, what could we do better next time. Um, and then intensivists um, available 24-7 so that you've got somebody who, um, who does this a lot available at the bedside. So what do your patients experience or understand about CPR? Anybody still watch this? I know it's been off the, the air for a couple years, but... Um, so uh, a group um, actually uh, led by John Lantos over at Children's Mercy looked at the first season of ER, Chicago Hope and Rescue 911 in 1994, um, found that uh, there were 60 occurrences of CPR on those three television shows that year, and survival was about 75%. How does that compare to what, what we looked at for in or out of hospital cardiac arrest? 
Yeah, really high. So they raised the question, is television giving our patients a, um, an unrealistic set of expectations um, and their families? And are people making decisions based on that? It's a little hard to know whether people are making decisions based on it. I've only once, um, when treating a patient, had a family member cite television CPR um, as um, the reason he was surprised that I was saying that his dad, who had metastatic cancer, was not likely to survive if he had a cardiac arrest. Um, but uh, he's probably not the only one who thought it. Um, so when you think about what's going on in television and movies, you've got um, now a more complicated scene. You've got reality TV. You've got the movies. You've got the soap operas and the dramas um, presenting medicine. And it goes back, again, to the beginning of media, because birth and death make pretty good subjects for drama. Um, so uh, my team looked at um, CPR and DNR events, actually, um, through uh, all 15 seasons of ER, but I'm just giving you these five to match them up in time with the seasons of House and Grey's Anatomy. Um, we uh, looked at every cardiac arrest um, on those episodes, and um, the, uh, the rest of that junk is just to say that my, um, my RAs were awesome. Um, so patients on ER were more likely to be teenagers, young adults, victims of trauma, and uninsured, which makes sense for a Chicago ER. Gray's Anatomy um, is a private hospital um, staffed uh, almost entirely by surgeons um, who apparently don't need any emergency docs or, um, or OBs or internists. Um, so everything happens in the OR. Um, and uh, house, um, is, um, house is its own thing. <laughs> um, when we looked at episodes of CPR on these shows, um, we found that uh, recovery of pulse um, for ER um, and Gray's Anatomy were pretty consistent with um, what is seen in registry studies um, on the order of 30 to 40 percent. Um, and House was a little higher, um, a lot higher. Um, and then uh, survival to hospital discharge wasn't quite the model we could use. So end of episode is the best we could do. Um, I also told the RAs you could only die once. So if you had six episodes of CPR, you could still only die once. Um, so we, uh, we couldn't count uh, all those episodes in the numerator. Um, but uh, again, survival on ER and Gray's Anatomy, 15% is what we see in real life. That's, you know, pretty close. So what, what does that tell me? It tells me that, um, that they had good medical um, advisors on those shows and that they were aiming for realism in at least this aspect of the medicine. Not so much a lot of other aspects, but this one. Um, and again, House is going to fix you. He's going to make you better. That's the whole thing about House. Um, I don't have the data for Scrubs here, but anybody want to guess where Scrubs falls? So we got accurate and more accurate. Um, they all die. It's like less than 5% survival. Um, most of the time, um, just off scene, um, patient dies. Um, our guy is, um, is distraught, and, um, and that's pretty much the picture of his internship. Um, so actually, it's a little low, um, but, um, but certainly more realistic than house. Um, we, uh, I had the, um, uh, my research assistants coded the rhythms, and um, while there were many unmonitored uh, resuscitations, by and large, if you were having VT or VF, you were more likely to survive. If you had a systole, um, that was, um, as is true in real life, largely a pre-mortem rhythm. Um, and uh, pulseless electrical activity, pretty much uh, they saw one out of th almost 350. Um, PEA is kind of hard to explain, you know. Um, all the rhythms were shocked no matter what. Um, and asystole patients mostly died. The other thing that, um, that the research assistants noticed is that there really actually were only two rhythms on the monitor if you looked at the screen. They had asystole and sinus. 
Nobody told the props people about VFib or VTAC. Um, but clearly the scripts were being reviewed by the medical directors and the, the, what they were saying in the dialogue fit with the medical scenario we were describing. So we just thought maybe we should go talk to the props people. Um, um, and then again, you've got trauma and ER and grays and rare weird diagnoses on house. Um, only seven cases of disability after CPR were noted in those 339 episodes. Um, two patients with brain death, um, one severe cardiac damage, pulmonary damage, uh, and uh, poor outcome. And this is the one that really troubled me. So across all the shows, we had 13 orders to do not uh, attempt resuscitation. In ER, they honored all of them except for the one they didn't know about. Well, that makes sense. That's fair. And that actually happens, unfortunately, in ERs um, fairly frequently. Um, they, uh, they did that on purpose for dramatic effect because it turned out it was a retired physician from ER who um, they resuscitated uh, against his wishes. Um, Gray's Anatomy, they only honored one of the four DNRs. And the next episode, her husband came back and shot up the place. And um, House isn't going to honor your DNR because the diagnosis is wrong. I'm going to fix it. Um, and so he does. So what does that tell people about having a DNR order? Either you're stupid on House or your doctor doesn't love you enough on Gray's Anatomy. Ooh, great. Um, so uh, the systematic ignoring of DNR orders, um, again, leaves a really troubling message for the population. Um, so when you think about the conversations you're going to end up having with patients and families about CPR, there are a lot of um, protocols and, um, and a lot of times that you'll see different strategies. Um, and I just have a few pieces of advice and a few resources, and then I'd love to, um, to open up for questions. Um, so the first thing is that these conversations have to be in the context of the person's larger illness. Um, as a, an internal medicine hospitalist, I was frequently faced with having to have the conversation about DNR at the same time I had the conversation about whether they were going to get the diabetic diet or the renal diet. Um, and that was simply because our, emerg our um, EMR required me to put code status in before I could order dinner. Um, but, but ideally, um, you're going to have that conversation once you have a diagnosis once you have a plan of care, once you have a sense of the prognosis of the person. And it's really going to be um, part of that larger conversation. Do you want to be resuscitated or not? It's not really a question that makes sense in isolation. It only makes sense in the setting of, you know, are you young and perfectly healthy and nobody expects your heart to stop? Well, then, of course, it makes sense to resuscitate you. Do you have cancer that we're going to try to treat? We're going to hope that things go well, but that if, if something causes your heart to stop, it's going to be because the cancer has progressed to a degree that it's not curable. Um, or are you somewhere in between? Do you have a heart condition where shocking you makes sense? Um, but I can't have that conversation with a patient or family without knowing what the larger context the patient is facing is. Um, on the other hand, the, um, this, uh, this checklist is arguing you never want to ask people if they want CPR. You want to ask, are there circumstances in which you might decide not to have it? And that also requires the patient and family knowing a little more about CPR than just what, um, what they found out on, um, on house. Um, you want to explain to the patient that CPR can bring a person's heart and breathing back, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have a good neurologic outcome. Um, and a lot of us struggle with how to explain the trauma of CPR. Um, you know, just so you know, 
if we're really doing our job right to push um, to push your heart, we're going to break your ribs. And is it worth it, um, given our expected outcome? Are we? Is that the best way to do things? The other thing to think about is having the family at the bedside um, is really important for a lot of folks at the end of life. And do you want to be surrounded by strangers? Do you want to be surrounded by your family? Do you want to have the family present for the resuscitation if the patient chooses to have one or if the family chooses? Um, and under what circumstances might you do that or not do that? Um, and then if a person decides they do not want CPR at the end of life, what paperwork do you have to fill out, both for your hospital and also for your state or community, to make sure that those wishes are honored to the best of our ability? Um, and then the two, the two last um, things I would give you in my wearing my palliative care hat are if a person has a high likelihood of a clinical decompensation that's going to require CPR or a ventilator or other procedures that, um, that mean that they may not be able to participate in that conversation about it or talk to their family after, I try to anticipate that that could happen and encourage them to have that conversation earlier. Um, it's not uncommon that I'll be in the cardiac intensive care unit with somebody who's recovering from heart failure and has gotten off a ventilator in the last couple days. And we'll say, um, you know, you're in the context of whether you're getting more aggressive advanced heart therapies, we need to think about whether you would want CPR um, if your heart should stop and what we think is likely happening in that situation. Um, what should we do um, if you're not able to speak for yourself? You're too short of breath. Please, please talk to your family because I don't want your children to feel guilty that they, they put you on a ventilator or didn't put you on a ventilator. What the data shows very clearly is that people whose loved ones know what they wanted, those loved ones are okay with it six, nine, 12 months later. It's the folks who wonder and who still wonder, was that really the right thing to do for mom? Is that what mom would have wanted? Who, um, who feel guilty, who are much more likely to have complicated grief and much more likely to, um, to struggle six, 10, 12 months later. Um, and, uh, and that last bit. So asking about other experiences, um, is really important if people are making a decision you may not expect. Um, when I'm working with families who come from underserved communities, who seem to be seeking more aggressive care than I would on average see in their condition, I always want to know, what's your experience of health care? How has mom's care gone up to now? Um, what, what happened with your parents, her parents, other family members? Because fairly quickly, you'll often find that folks in those circumstances are making decisions because they're scared that if they give you permission to stop, you'll stop too soon. And ultimately, what most people are seeking is what you would do for your mom. Not necessarily everything, even if they say everything. And, um, and there's uh, some great work on what do people mean when they say they want everything. Um, but they, they want to feel assured that, um, that this is what, um, what you would do if this were your mom. But whenever people ask me that question, I always try to be even-handed. I always try to say, OK, if my mom were here, she would make this choice for this reason. And then I'm not above making up a relative. Um, but my Aunt Susie would make this other choice for this reason. Because it's not what my mom wants that really matters to them. But what reason would you have for making one or the other decision that's much more helpful to people? And with that, um, here's just a couple of resources on having these conversations. And I would love questions, comments, experiences.
the difference when uh, someone receives CPR and the survival rates versus when they don't receive CPR. And I'm curious about um, different circumstances or variables that creates um, no difference between those two situations, you know, such as age differences or things like that. And is there research or is there good information about those types of things where it actually doesn't make a difference whether or not they get CPR or not? Yes. So um, older folks who have multiple chronic illnesses, basically the best outcomes are going to be people who have an isolated problem that's pretty clear that is responsive to CPR. So drowning victims, choking victims, um, folks who have a shockable rhythm who get shocked, um, f young, f healthy folks who have an arrhythmia. Um, but then also folks who, are, who have heart disease, who, um, who have a cardiac arrest, who need CPR or need a shock, but who don't have many other things wrong. So if you look at folks who have two, three, four organ systems involved, they've got heart disease and kidney failure, heart disease and uh, liver failure, heart disease, liver and kidney failure. Those patients are unlikely to do well no matter what happens. It's, um, it's really, CPR is, um, is best used as a tool in situations in which the heart or lungs have failed for a reason that can be expected to be reversed. Um, and so if you look at the difference between adults and kids in this situation, um, kids usually have one thing wrong, and often it's something they can grow out of. So um, a lot of our, um, our neonatal ICU babies were waiting for their lungs to grow. We're waiting for them to produce enough surfactant. We're waiting, and that can be expected to happen. So it's our, our older patients with multiple chronic illnesses who often don't do well no matter what you do. Um, so in those situations, in those situations then, is it still standard protocol with people who are unlikely to do well to still do CPR anyway? So that's a great question. And there are differences um, from country to country. In the United States, by and large, in most settings, it's treated that you have a right to CPR, number one. Number two, unless a person has an out-of-hospital do not resuscitate order, an uh, emergency medical technician or a paramedic is essentially required to do CPR, unless the person's in rigor mortis or they get a doc on the phone and the doc says, yeah, that, that's not a circumstance in which it makes sense. Um, and so we, we follow a protocol of doing it maybe when we shouldn't in order to prevent not, uh, in order to prevent fit, um, folks who could have benefited not getting it. Because if you don't do it in the first two, three minutes, don't bother um, is, uh, is the challenge. And so you can't decide later, oh, that was a good candidate for it. Um, in the hospital, um, it's by and large done unless the, pers the patient says um, that they don't want it, the family members say they don't want it, or the doctor looks at the clinical scenario and says this is not going to help. But most patients who die with a full code order in a hospital will get a full code even if they are in an ICU and multi-organ failure not expected to survive. Um, there are some exceptions, but not too many. Anyone else? Dr. Kearns, I was having a conversation uh, just recently in the hospital with a family who um, had medical professionals uh, taking care of 90 plus year old mom um, and were very upset about a, a, a consultant physicians asking them, they felt pressuring them about a DNAR order. And um, we just want to, you know, affirm your, your sense that oftentimes that is related to a previous experience. So as I listened, it, in fact, it was a previous experience that this healthcare professional caring for, <clears throat> for mom um, had with her own mom. Um, 
This is mother-in-law, and this is, and in her mom, mom's situation a few years earlier, when the DNR order was put in effect, they experienced that healthcare professionals caring for mom thought that meant um, no treatment whatsoever. Right. Um, so that's probably the biggest risk um, of agreeing to a do not resuscitate order. And while it's not supposed to happen, it does. Um, and so either making sure that your hospital staff and, um, and trainees understand that do not do CPR doesn't necessarily mean do not do anything. Um, and also that, um, that patients' trust in our systems relies on the fact that we're going to do what, um, what we say we're going to do. Um, so that, that includes uh, recognizing that just because the person is do not resuscitate doesn't mean they may still want blood draws, they may still want, they may still want chemotherapy, they may still want blood transfusions, they may still want lots of things. Um, and, uh, and so I have heard both healthcare providers and non-healthcare providers who have said, yeah, don't, don't be DNR because they're, um, they're going to ignore you. Um, the other is if a patient or family says the questions about do not resuscitate are becoming badgering, um, I usually just start with saying to the team, don't ask for the next 48 hours, okay? Um, because the, if, if the patient understood and the patient said no, then it's our instinct as healthcare providers to think about this in a cognitive way. I would have chosen DNR for my mom in this circumstance. They did not choose DNR for their mom. Therefore, they didn't understand what I said. When usually the case is they heard you perfectly fine. They get the fact that mom is dying. And they're not emotionally ready to let go. And responding to an emotional need with a cognitive answer um, just produces crossed wires and a lot of unhappiness and actually still doesn't get you that DNR order that you wanted. And by the way, why do you want it so desperately anyway? Anyone else? If not, please join me in thanking Dr. Carla Kearns for a wonderful lecture. There are sign-in sheets. If you didn't get signed in, make sure.